thank you, thank you very much, uh, Abhi Ruchi, for uh, your introduction and for the invitation. Uh, and my thanks as well to the Vice Chancellor of the Central University of Kashmir and to the staff uh, for facilitating uh, this uh, uh, lecture and for the invitation. Uh, and I would be happy to, I should say, uh, on a personal note, I would be happy to uh, take up the invitation to visit Kashmir in person. I have been there uh, in 2008 and in 2010. Uh, on both occasions, I had a very interesting set of experiences, but that's a subject for uh, another lecture, for another time. Um, and I think it will take more than the end of COVID-19 to make it possible for people to really travel really and openly in Kashmir. Uh, so the subject uh, of today's talk, uh, as has been mentioned, is Gandhi, the Jews, and the question of Palestine. And I want to uh, begin with a prologue uh, to my remarks. Uh, the first is uh, really a very short comment by way of saying that this uh, set of remarks today has been formally written up as a very long paper. Um, and though I will try to speak uh, informally as well. I will be reading portions uh, of this paper. Uh, the second is a much more substantive note on a matter of the prologue, uh, which is that we have to begin with the paradox. The paradox is that Palestine is a place and it's a non-place. It's a place that doesn't exist. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, can be illustrated by a number of things. For example, there is a Palestinian filmmaker uh, Eli Suleiman, who made uh, quite an extraordinary film called Divine Intervention in 2002, which is a film that, uh, for those of you who are interested in film history, uh, owes a lot to Buster Keaton, Jacques Paty, some of the great uh, cinematic masterworks, actually, uh, are works that he had studied, I think. Um, and it shows life under occupation um, in, in Palestine. Uh, the film did not compete. It was nominated uh, uh, for uh, the best foreign film for, uh, in the Academy Awards for 2002, but it was disqualified because the Academy ruled that such a place did not exist. And so therefore this film was not representing a known nation state, that Palestine was not a legitimate nation. And that's what I mean by non-place. Um, I would also remind uh, the listeners that the first American president who actually spoke about Palestine, as opposed to the Palestinian people or the Palestinian territories or the forthcoming nation, perhaps, right? all of these expressions that were used, the first American who actually mentioned Palestine was a really important We're talking about 2025 20, years ago before the mentioned at all. All right. So uh, I think that it's worthwhile reflecting on this because eventually, of course, the weird towards the end of my argument, you will see that, and I think as a recipient of the uh, by Professor Oja as well, that uh, this uh, talk is really in a sense about, about not only about Palestine, but it is ultimately about related to the idea of home and the homeland and what do we mean by possession and dispossession of home and so on, right? Uh, now, by way of this prologue, I also want to begin with a long quotation from um, uh, the most, the, the really well-known work by Hannah Arendt, The Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, where in short term, I think that she write, um, let me just, uh, if I can just uh, try to see if I can anything else, because I'm getting a lot of sound from all kinds of places and it's, it's extremely distracting. Uh, so I'm gonna try to see if I can mute uh, everyone else for the time being. I don't know if I have any ability to do that, but I'm going to request because it's very hard for me to concentrate and I'm, I'm just getting too many noises from all kinds of places. Um, all right, so this quotation is uh, the following. 
after the war, it turned out, she says, that the Jewish question, which was considered the only insoluble one, was indeed solved, namely by means of a colonized and then conquered territory, but this solved neither the problem of the minorities nor of the stateless. On the contrary, like virtually all other events of our century, the solution of the Jewish question merely produced a new category of refugees, the Arabs, thereby increasing the number of the stateless and rightless by another 700,000 to 800,000 people. And what happened in Palestine within the, small, within the smallest of territory and in terms of hundreds of thousands was then repeated in India on a large scale involving many millions of people. Since the peace treaties of 1919 and 1920, the refugees and the stateless have attached themselves like a curse to all the newly established states on earth, which were created in the image of the nation state. For these new states, this curse bears the germs of a deadly sickness. And quote, right? Uh, and of course, this, this quotation has all the greater resonance right now, because now we're talking about the germs of another sickness, but, there is, but that sickness is particularly uh, of this moment, whereas the sickness that she was speaking about, the germs of that deadly disease that she's speaking about are really, of course, the sickness of that entity called the nation state. So, so my explorations today are really also, of course, a, a commentary per force on the whole problem of um, uh, the nation state. Um, now, um, let me begin formally then with uh, the paper itself. On 26 November 1938, Gandhi published in his journal Harijan a reasonably lengthy statement entitled simply, The Jews. My sympathies, he candidly stated, are all with the Jews and yet he could not be blind to the requirement of justice. The cry for the national home for the Jews does not make much appeal to me. This is one of the two sentences that has been parsed many times by people. I repeat, the cry for the national home for the Jews does not make much appeal to me. The sanction for it is sought in the Bible and the tenacity with which the Jews have hankered after return to Palestine. Why should they not, like other people of the earth, make that country their home, where they are born and where they earn their livelihood? End quote. Now, he had penned these reflections on November 20th. They published six days later in response, as he wrote in the opening paragraph, to several letters asking him to declare his views about the Arab Jewish question in Palestine and the persecution of the Jews in Germany. Earlier that month, in a single night of terror, that same month of November of 1938, in a single night of terror crystallized as crystal mark, that is the night of broken glass, SS intruders, often joined by German civilians, went on a systematic and unchecked rampage in Nazi Germany and parts of Austria against Jewish homes, shops, businesses, and synagogues, thereby signaling their determination to put into place a policy of annihilationist horror that would eventually lead to what is known as, of course, the final solution. A quarter of the Jewish male population of Germany was on that single night dispatched to concentration camps. Now, this statement that he, that he makes on November 20th has had a fugitive existence. And I'll modify that immediately in a moment, as you'll see, that fugitive existence, that is until quite recently. And when I say fugitive existence, I mean that more or less it was buried. If you look at, let's say, I'm hearing some noise in the background. Okay. So, so, so these, uh, uh, you know, these studies have largely the studies that have been done, let's say, of the Arab Jewish conflict or the conflict over Palestine and, you know, what's happening in the occupied territories over the last several decades, almost all of them 
really ignored what Gandhi had written. Norman Finkelstein was one of the, is one of the principal scholars in recent, let's say 15, 20 years to have resuscitated that. In fact, now there are a number of scholars who have actually looked, including Judith Butler very recently at some of what Gandhi has written on these questions, you know. Uh, now, on, uh, among Indians who were working on uh, uh, India's policy towards Israel, which I don't have time to go over in this particular lecture, and which is not really germane anyhow to the subject, uh, all of those writers have very well been aware of what Gandhi wrote. And, and, and it is sometimes been argued that they basically actually relied largely upon what Gandhi had, had written. Um, um, uh, when one is looking at this, the other thing that is ordinarily brought up, and I mentioned that right at the outset, is the two letters that Gandhi addressed to Adolf Hitler. Okay, um, and 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 I uh, and I want to just spend a minute on that because uh, you know if you go to the internet and you go to these internet trolls as as they are known today, uh, I mean there are people who have actually argued that because Gandhi addressed both of these letters to Hitler as dear friend, that he was therefore a friend of Hitler. Now, I don't think that one can get much more stupid than that, if I may be quite honest and blunt about it, because of course one has to understand that, that Gandhi uh, was a person who did not recognize even this category called the enemy. You, there's, there's, there's an opposition, yes, there's someone whom you oppose, someone who is your antagonist, uh, but this uh, uh, idea uh, uh, that that uh, impels Gandhi to address Hitler as a friend is because, of course, he holds on to the view that ontologically speaking, there is no such thing as a, a monster. Their people's acts may be monstrous, but no one is a monster because everyone has something of the spark of divinity within them, right? That would be one way of really looking at that particular framework. Um, it's also interesting, although it's, although again, I mentioned that really as somewhat of an aside in a way, just to give you a flavor of some of the discourse that has come up around this question in recent years, that neither of these letters was actually ever um, received by Hitler because both of these letters were intercepted by the British, all mail was censored going out from India. Uh, at this time, uh, and uh, it's a very interesting question why the British thought it desirable to censor letters written by Gandhi uh, uh, to Hitler and to ensure that they were never received by their uh, intended recipient. Um, but let's go back to that statement, um, and let's go back to the context in which he makes that particular statement, and, and I want to reiterate that for anyone who's seriously interested in this question, I think this particular statement published in Harijan is the fundamental document that one has to look at to understand Gandhi's position, although there are a number of other documents which I will be adverting to uh, uh, shortly in the course of my uh, remarks. Uh, uh, it has also been suggested apropos of both this document and the letters that he addressed to Hitler, that it has been suggested that Gandhi was not a very learned man at all. Uh, that he was not particularly well read uh, and that he was not particularly well informed uh, about what was going on. Uh, this is, for example, the position that has been argued uh, by uh, a scholar at JNU, Professor Kumara Swami, who wrote an article and I believe a whole book on that subject, although I haven't seen the book, but I have seen the article published in 2018 uh, on, on, on Gandhi's uh, statement uh, and uh, and the problems of it, uh, interpretation, you know. So fundamentally his view is that Gandhi was really quite ill-informed uh, about Zionism, uh, about uh, the history and politics of Palestine and, and all of that. Um, it is certainly also the case that once one is past the Khilafat movement, then from let's say the 1921-22 until the second half of 1937, there is barely a reference to Palestine from Gandhi. They made their occasional remarks about Jews scattered in the collected works, uh, but there's really nothing about uh, Palestine. Um, and there was, of course, as you know, an Arab revolt in 1936, but Gandhi certainly did not come to it. And so one interesting, uh, one other interesting question that arises is what, what is it? Uh, that led to the revival of his interest, if one may put it this way, um, in the question of Palestine in 
eight. All right. Um, now, uh, in uh, in order to understand that, uh, uh, I would like to um, uh, begin with actually and work my way backwards for a moment. Um, that in 1947, uh, Reuters special correspondent, May 1947. So this is just a few months before, of course, um, the independence and partition uh, of India. Uh, it, that Reuters correspondent asks Gandhi, what is the solution of the Palestine problem? That's the exact question. And Gandhi replies, it has become a problem which seems almost insoluble. And really that's quite remarkable because this is 1947. I mean, it's even before the creation of the state of Israel, right? And that he had arrived so early at this estimate, into, so early into this dispute at this estimate is disconcerting, but equally a sign of his awareness that the conflict could not be resolved within the ambit of what we call normal politics, right? Here, as has happened so often, many of the advocates of nonviolent resistance have appealed to various publics with the arguments that since all other remedies have failed, it is time that nonviolence was given its just due in the marketplace of opportunity, right? Now, it is far more than the weariness with this unending cycle of violence that should compel us to turn to his pronouncement. Why should we turn to the pronouncement, right? And in saying this, the first thing that needs to be said is that it is doubtful that the news of the atrocities of Kristallnacht had reached Gandhi in Segam, Varda, basically, right? An obscure village in the heartland of India where he had ensconced himself a few years ago, all right? Um, and so therefore, some people are inclined to think that had he been better informed, he might have taken a different view. My submission to you in the first instance is that that's not the case at all. His statement was written with the full awareness of the extent to, of the depravity into which the Nazis had sunk. It's written with a full awareness of that if you read the whole clip, and you'll see portions of that appear in my, in my remarks. One must not suppose that, on the other hand, that writing in November 1938, that he had any premonition, any more than anyone else did, of the gross evil that was about to unfold. I mean, enormous evil had already taken place, but this was, of course, the beginning of it, in, in a way, um, because the killing camps had not really, the, con the concentration camps were not extermination camps at this point in time. I mean, I don't have the time to go into that distinction between the two, but there is a distinction. All right, uh, and, and in fact, as a little footnote, it's important to remember that Dachau, which is the first concentration camp in Germany, was not actually set up for the Jews at all. It was actually set up for the communists and for other radicals and for other dissenters, not for the Jews, you know, all right. So in November 1938, when he's writing this, it's not that he had any premonition, Gandhi or anyone else, of the evil that was about to unfold. Uh, and that therefore, consequently, he may have been more receptive to the Jewish case, some people would say, had he written his article when the mass slaughter of Jews had commenced in the concentration camps at Auschwitz, Treblinka, and elsewhere. Quite to the contrary, Gandhi had condemned the Nazi regime in the strongest possible terms in his article. The German persecution of the Jews, he wrote, and I'm quoting here, seems to have no parallel in history. No parallel in history. The tyrants of old never went so mad as Hitler seems to have gone. And he is doing with it with a religious zeal. For he is propounding a new religion of exclusive and militant nationalism in the name of which any inhumanity becomes an act of humanity to be rewarded here and thereafter, end quote. So Gandhi's article of 1938 should then be taken as a summation of his views on Jewish claims to a homeland in Palestine. And I think the case for or against him, if one is interested in doing something of that kind, 
right? If you're interested in that kind of zero sum politics, because I don't think it's, a, what I'm trying to say is it's not a matter of making a case for him or against him on this, but if one wanted to do it, then everything rests with this particular article. Now, there are various ways in, in which one can approach it, and there are various considerations. And I'm going to go through a whole set of considerations systematically, right? He commences his article with the observation that his sympathies, and I've quoted this, are all with the Jews. His closest European associates and friends in South Africa were nearly all Jews. And it is only a touch of exaggeration on his part when he describes some of them as having become lifelong companions. Gandhi's at one time flourishing legal practice in Johannesburg was managed by a Jewish woman, Sonia Slesen. She's a woman of Lithuanian origin. The journalist Henry Polak, who had arrived in South Africa from Britain and began to work on the Transvaal Critic, a newspaper entirely typical in its open display of racism towards Indians and Africans was slowly drawn to Gandhi. Their friendship blossomed and Polak would go on to serve as the editor of Indian Opinion, the first of several newspapers either founded or very closely associated with Gandhi. He moved into Phoenix settlement, similarly the first of Gandhi's several extended experiments in communal living and the two lived as blood brothers. This is what Gandhi says in his autobiography. It is Polak who effected one of the most transformative moments in Gandhi's life when he slipped a copy of Ruskin's Unto This Last, which Gandhi would later render into Gujarati as Sarvodaya or Welfare for All into his hands as he was about to commence a train journey. Herman Kallenbach completed the all important Jewish triumvirate, an architect of Lithuanian German stock. He was an unlikely candidate as a disciple or even friend of Gandhi, well-built and athletic, Kallenbach was devoted to sports, but his distinction resides perhaps in the fact that he was the first of many men and women of substantial means who felt mesmerized in Gandhi's presence. They shared lodgings together in Johannesburg um, and the intimacy of their correspondence can be, uh, can be inferred from the fact that they uh, that uh, uh, Gandhi is called upper house and uh, Kallenbach lower house, right? So this is how they term each other in their correspondence. The onset of World War I, which saw Gandhi leave for India and Kallenbach interned in the Isles of Man as a German citizen, led to an agonizing separation between the two that would last until May 1937, when Kallenbach arrived in India as an emissary of the Jewish agency charged with garnering the support of Gandhi and the Congress leadership for the aspirations of Jewish people in Palestine. When Kallenbach died in 1945, the Indian opinion declared that among Gandhi's associates, he was known as Hanuman. As Hanuman was to Sri Ram, so was Mr. Kallenbach to Mahatma Gandhi, says the Indian opinion. Now in South Africa, as Gandhi had once remarked in 1931, I was surrounded by Jews. His statement of November 1938 establishes his credentials in this respect, and at once points to two considerations that Gandhi sought to bring to the attention of his readers. First, no one could say that Gandhi had no proximity to Jews, or that he was unaware of the peculiarities of their history. Through these friends, he writes, I came to learn much of their age-long persecution. They have been the untouchables of Christianity. We'll return to this later on. Let us leave aside for the present this parallel, as I've said. Um, the history of Jewish thing, Gandhi appears to be suggesting, is not known to him merely as an abstraction, as a factotum gleaned from some encyclopedia. Rather, this suffering is, so to speak, writ large on the faces of his Jewish friends. And yet, since friendships can be blinding, it is perforce necessary that the more common universal reason should also nudge him towards sympathy for the Jews. So it's not just this friendship, right? Uh, because friendship makes one partial, uh, but rather that they, he says there's a more universal common reason. Right? Secondly, to the extent that Gandhi had close friendships with Jews, he was duty bound to subject his sympathy for them to the rigorous test of justice. Right? It is particularly our friendships that we have to put to the test of justice. 
sympathy should not be confused for partiality. And so we come to that formulation, which we have encountered before. The cry for the national home for the Jews does not make much appeal to me. In advancing a case against Jewish claims to a homeland in Palestine, Gandhi dwells on the ethics of belonging. Thus he argues, and this is that one sentence which every article on the subject has quoted, every book and article. He argues, quote, Palestine belongs to the Arabs in the same sense that England belongs to the English or France to the French. And Professor Kumaraswamy, that article I referred to published in 2018 says that, look, this shows the hollowness of Gandhi's argument because Gandhi dared not say that Palestine belongs to the Arabs in the same sense that Germ Germany belongs to the Germans, right? Okay, but of course, the reason why Gandhi will not invoke Germany in this context is First of all, there's a whole set of reasons, but the first primary reason is that nation making was a much more critical enterprise in France and in England. I mean, we have to remember that Germany was not even unified until the late 19th century. And in fact, people spoke predominantly of Prussianism, not of German ideology, okay, right, or German belonging. So, so one would have to understand why he's picking these two examples, because the target really here is the whole idea of the nation state, the project of the nation state. And France and England in that sense were the two predominant examples that were set up for the rest of the world, which is, where, which is the kind of argument you can see very clearly in Eugene Weber's wonderful book. Uh, peasants turned into Frenchmen. What led to the making of France? What exactly makes France France, so to speak, right? Nonetheless, this argument that Gandhi says does not in the first instance appear to be a morally compelling argument, particularly in view of Gandhi's recognition of the Jewish invocation of a biblical sanction to claim Palestine for the Jews. Does priority of arrival or origin confer unqualified and exclusive rights to possession of land. We know, for example, the Native Americans were, were invariably stripped, robbed by white Europeans of their lands, but the same white Europeans have for generations since then used the priority of their arrival to disenfranchise later immigrants and draw themselves up as examples of true blood Americans, right? On the other hand, how would Gandhi have assessed the post-colonial rejoinder encountered among formerly colonized immigrants to England or France who were confronted with the ugly, ugly face of racism that quote, we are here because you were there. If Gandhi might now appear to be in some difficulty, it once puts a different inflection on the notion of belonging. It is wrong, he says, and inhuman to impose the Jews on the Arabs. What is going on in Palestine today cannot be justified by any moral code of conduct. The mandates have no sanction but that of the last war. Palestine can only be turned into a national home for the Jews by reducing the proud Arabs to not, to nothingness, which would be a crime against humanity. Now, if one had to ask how precisely the Jews were being imposed on the Arabs, the answer lies, of course, in that, in the first instance, in that torrid history, which commences with what is called the Balfour Declaration. I won't go over that. Uh, a, a foreign, British foreign official who would have been completely obscure, but of course, but for this particular document, uh, where, by the way, he does not promise Palestine to the Jews, but rather a national home for them in Palestine, which is not the same thing. You could have a binational state, which would be a national home for the Jews and for the Arabs. It's not the same as saying Palestine is just yours and yours only. He's not promising Palestine to the Jews. The Balfour Declaration really doesn't do that. But this distinction, I think, has been really largely overlooked because it's been read in a, a, a particular way. All right. Um, 
the fact that this declaration was at all possible owed everything to the prerogatives that Britain and France exercised in carving out spheres of influence in West Asia, or as it's known in the US, the Middle East. Much later, Nehru echoed the idea already implicit in Gandhi's suggestion that a Jewish homeland would be an imposition on the Arabs. Quote, I'm quoting Nehru here, British imperialism played its hand so cleverly that the conflict became the conflict between Arab and Jews, and the British government cast itself in the role of umpire, end quote. Some might contend that the role of Britain in the creation of Israel has been exaggerated. Anti-Semitism was certainly rampant in the British Foreign Office, uh, but one can just as convincingly argue that American Protestantism accommodates both deep-seated anti-Semitism and at the same time, and unstinting support for Israel. It's possible to have both of that simultaneously. The more important thing here, which um, in fact, Professor Oja in her, in, when she, in her opening remarks, sort of adverted to that, uh, is the history of obviously Jewish um, uh, immigration uh, into Palestine. The Jew Jews will start to pour into Palestine. 8,000 Jewish immigrants arrived in 1923. Two years later, the number rose to 34 thousand. These numbers might have been sustained in the second half of the 1920s, but for the worldwide depression. However, once the economic, economic recovery occurred, uh, beginning in the 1930s, 33, 34, uh, and the onset of anti-Semitism, this led to a resurgence of Jewish immigration into Palestine. In 1935, 61,800 Jews arrived in Palestine in 1935 alone, and from constituting less than one-tenth of the population at the eve of World War I, the Jewish community numbered about one-third of the population at the eve of the Second World War. All right, so you can see the significant shift. This demographic shift, if you had to sort of think of an analogy, you have to really think about the, about the territorialization of Tibet by the Han Chinese. It's the same strategy that the Chinese have deployed in many ways. And it's a very interesting question, which I will not take up in my, in, in my paper here today. Although of course in Kashmir, it's, it's a question that is, uh, that must, uh, you know, uh, invariably come up in a way, uh, which is that, is this one of the, you know, people, I, I think that the tendency is to always compare Palestine, but uh, uh, for, for good reasons, uh, what's happening there. But I think that we can also think in some respects uh, of what the Chinese have done um, in, in Tibet uh, as well. Now, having declared his opposition to a Jewish national home in Palestine, even as he characterizes Germany as a country that has shown how, quote, hideous, terrible, and terrifying it looks in its nakedness, uh, Gandhi proposes what appears to be an anodyne, if indisputably reasonable solution. Quote, the nobler course of action would be to insist on a just treatment of the Jews wherever they are born and bred. The Jews born in France are French in precisely the same sense that Christians born in France are French, end quote. That this is not a sentiment that Gandhi had struck upon at a moment's notice is amply clear from his statement on Zionism released to the Jewish agency a year earlier. And that's what I meant when I said that it's really in 1937 that his interest starts in this again, as it were, where he gives it as his opinion that, quote, the Jews should disclaim any intention of realizing their aspiration under the protection of arms and should rely wholly on the goodwill of Arabs. This is very, very significant because one of the reasons why Gandhi is going to insistently oppose the Jewish claim there is he says it rests on, the case rests on arms. That is that it is backed up by British arms, much like Israel is backed up by American arms post 1948, down to the present day. Right. OK. I mean, that that whatever court claim to justness tacitly, there is always military strength behind that. All right. Jews were wait were to wait for a home in Palestine until such time 
as quote, Arab opinion was ripe for that possibility. And I quote, and the best way to enlist that opinion is to rely wholly upon the moral justice of the desire and therefore the moral sense of the Arabs and the Islamic world. Now, and quote, you can see one reason why Gandhi would be laughed out of court today by many people because they would say, given the kind of Islamophobia that has become very common, they would say that, well, you know, this would mean waiting in eternity, right? To wait for the moral sense of the Arabs to, to bring some kind of uh, a, a solution to this, to bring a moral impetus into this question is, is out of the realm of possibility, right? That would be, that would be one rejoinder that that some people would really say, and of course, I, I and I think you could you could you could clearly say that if mere insistence on just treatment were enough, the world would have no need for liberation movements, anti-colonial struggles, and all of that. How does one, therefore, the question is, how does one calibrate the difference between insistence, persuasion, and coercion? And if insistence is to be more than insistence as a persistent, forceful, and articulate expression of sentiments, then we have to ask what is the measure of insistence? Gandhi's own life amply suggests that he had an expansive conception of the insistent struggle for rights. And his Satyagra campaigns, especially in India, were went well beyond what is ordinarily understood by the term insistence. But there were mitigating circumstances that in Gandhi's judgment had diminished whatever moral case could be advanced on behalf of the Jewish aspirations. Jewish dependence on arms, as I've now suggested, had greatly eroded the credibility of Jewish nationalists who had nothing but the naked strength of British imperialism to press their demands. What impressed Gandhi even more was what he took to be a distinct and salutary aspect of Jewish history, one that should have emboldened rather than demoralized them. Who else, Gandhi is really saying, who else but the Jew can claim the world as his or her own? If Jews were desirous of having a national home, were they willing to disavow their rightful claims over all the lands where they had put down roots? And here I think, India would be an extraordinarily interesting illustration of what Gandhi had in mind, although he doesn't mention the history of Jews in India, right? Because, because what Gandhi is really saying is that, look, wherever Jews have been, they have had a long history. And in a country like India or China, by the way, the only other country besides India, which doesn't really have any history of anti-Semitism at all. And you don't have to take my word for it. You just read John Rowland, who's written several books on this. Why I'm talking about white scholars who's written and Jewish scholars uh, who's written several histories of Jews in India. Uh, and, and we're speaking of Jews in India. We're speaking about several distinct communities. We're speaking about about the white Jews of Cochin. We're speaking about uh, the the Baghdadi Jews, the Malabari Jews. Uh, the Bene Israel, the, at least these four very distinct communities with, with quite distinct histories as well, right? Or you read Nathan Katz, The Jews of India, Who Are the Jews of India, published by University of California Press about two, three decades ago. Um, and, and all of them are emphatically clear, all the scholars who worked on that, that India is one country in the world where you could not find any instance of anti-Semitism, except when the Portuguese were in India. That's when you find at the hands of the Portuguese, the Jews starting to suffer, okay? Right, which is, uh, you know, par for the course, given who the Portuguese are, really, okay? Now, so therefore what Gandhi is really saying here is that, you know, the Jews are extraordinarily fortunate because they are in the position of being able to claim wherever they live as their homeland. All right, and that is in fact a much greater thing. I mean, I'm putting it very colloquially. I'm, it's a much greater thing than having a nation state of your own, right? But he's also saying, and I hear I quote, right? Will they relish the idea of being forced to leave the other parts of the world? That once you claim a Jewish homeland, then the expectation is that all Jews will go there, okay? Or do they, and in fact, it might be the grounds for their oppression wherever they are, right? 
or do they want a double home where they can remain at will? This right of the national home, I'm quoting him, affords a colorable justification for the German expulsion of the Jews, right? And of course, some people have argued that, well, the German expulsion of the Jews was happening even before. It's not like they needed a pretext, but, but this is only an illustration that Gandhi is giving. And of course, the expulsion of the Jews definitely increased after the advent of the Nazi regime. In fact, we have to also remember that in that one of the things that that uh, 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 backs up Gandhi here is that Germany was the country where the Jews were best integrated. This is what Professor Kumaraswamy doesn't understand at all when he uses this quote and says, well, that's just hypocrisy because the Nazis didn't need the pretext. They were going to expel them anyhow, you know. No, the fact of the matter is that that German Jews were very well integrated. Anti-Semitism was a much bigger problem in, in France than it was in Germany. Why the Holocaust happened in Germany is a problem that we can't look at at the moment. But, it's, but this is something that is, I think, widely recognized by people who have looked at the history of anti-Semitism um, in Europe, all right? Now, at this juncture, before entering into a consideration of the response to Gandhi's statement by enlightened Jewish opinion, it would do well to probe the reasons that may have informed Gandhi's thinking on the notion of a Jewish homeland. I mean, I've already been probing that, but I want to probe it a bit further. Uh, as I pointed out, he treasured his association with numerous Jewish friends. Um, and uh, in, this, in this particular statement of November, 26, 1938, he even mentions a book by Cecil Roth, a well-known book called The Jewish Contribution to Civilization, uh, where he points out that the Jewish people have enriched the world's literature, art, music, drama, science, medicine, agriculture. He could also claim similar friendships um, in the Arab world, but to a lesser degree. Okay, but he, but, he, but he did have a following in the Arab world. I mean, there's been two books that have been written recently about, about uh, uh, how well-known Arab uh, Gandhi was in the Arab world, and he was surprisingly well-known, surprisingly well-known. I mean, there are newspapers where his activities were reported constantly throughout the 20s um, and the 1930s. Um, uh, and you might remember some of you that when he went to London uh, for the Roundtable Conference, uh, as the emissary of the Indian National Congress, that that one of the places he stopped at was Suez. Uh, he stopped at Suez, and 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 when and when uh, you know the uh, the ship docks at Port uh, Said, um, uh, he meets a whole delegation of people there. There's a very interesting report about this in in Al Aram, one of the major newspapers uh, of that time, September 7th. If anyone wants to. Uh, look it up. Um, it is reasonable to assume that given the supreme importance that Gandhi attached, I also want to suggest now uh, to the question of Hindu-Muslim relations in India, that he would not have been unimpressed with the necessity of cultivating close ties with the Muslim world. Indeed, nearly all commentators takes it, take it as axiomatic that his views on a Jewish national home were profoundly shaped by the imperative to sustain friendly Hindu-Muslim relations and even as the demand for Pakistan began to gain adherence to keep India undivided. On 4th July 1937, Herman Kallenbach, who had been reunited with Gandhi in India after more than 20 years, carried a message for the Zionist leadership at the Jewish Agency, offering the services of the Congress and facilitating a direct conversation between Arabs and Jews only. The Mohammedan population of India being 70 million, the letter concludes, is by far the most important in the world. The intervention of some of their leaders with a view to reach conciliation may have far-reaching results. What do you think about it? Once before, when it was put to Gandhi that his attachment to the Khilafat caused him to go well beyond his desire to see justice on the Khilafah, Gandhi had admitted, quote, attaining of justice is undoubtedly the cornerstone and if I found that I was wrong in my conception of justice on this question, I hope I should have the courage to retrace my steps. But by helping the Mohammedans of India at a critical moment of their history, I want to buy their friendship." End quote. Had Gandhi then surrendered to political compulsions, 
in opposing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Or at least, as shall be seen shortly, a homeland that apparently could not be brought about except as a consequence of the imposition of British imperial interests. Could it be that the demand for a Jewish homeland, whether taken to be contiguous with undivided Palestine or to be carved out at if it were to be conceded, that it would strengthen the hands of those in India who clamored for the vivisection of India, right? For the division of India, would it strengthen their hands? Of course, one could have argued from the other end of the political spectrum. If a section of Muslims in India were prepared to wage a struggle for the creation of a homeland where their interests would allegedly be better and more equitably represented, by what right could they deny the same privilege to Jews in Muslim-dominated Palestine? To Jewish leaders, the logic of the Muslim position might have seemed inescapably pragmatic. While in India, they profess to speak as a victimized minority, albeit a sizable minority, and Palestine, speaking from a position of strength, they rejected the claims of another minority. Right? Now, even a minimal familiarity with Gandhi's worldview suggests why the cold calculations that doubtless inform the views of many of his contemporaries and subsequent commentators are unlikely, I would submit, to have entered into his deliberations on the Jewish question. This is apart from the consideration that the Jewish minority in Palestine cannot be said to have an isomorphic relationship to the Muslim minority in India. Not only were Muslims in India both numerically and proportionately a much greater portion of the whole population, but they also occupied a significantly different relationship to Hindus than the Jews among Christians, right? The language of majority and minority belongs to an enumerative universe rather than to the fuzzy world in which Jews were non-Christians, but nevertheless not a statistical aggregate that we describe as a minority. Much as the Muslims of India, even when they were not part of a ruling elite, were never simply a minority. It is doubtful that Gandhi had any use at all for this modern form of political arithmetic. Indeed, everything in his political and ethical views militated against those crass considerations that have led to the frightening and ethically numbing normalization of politics. All right? If at all we are to understand why Gandhi found himself unable to support the idea of a national Jewish home in Palestine, we shall have to abandon altogether the easy comforts of the view that try as he might, he could not overlook the political expediency of furnishing support to Indian Muslims, especially at a demand at a time when the demands for separation had greatly accelerated. True, Gandhi had often declared that no cause was as dear to him as the solidarity of Muslims and Hindus. And he had gone so far as to say, quote, I do not want Swaraj without Hindu Muslim unity, end quote. But Hindu Muslim unity purchased through sheer submission to naked political calculations could not be the grounds for Swaraj either. Let me turn then to the considerations that in my judgment weighed heavily with Gandhi. However, inconsistent this argument appears to be with his repudiation of Jewish claims to a homeland, it must be a national home. It must be recognized that Gandhi perceived himself as an advocate of Zionism. And this is also very surprising because he says, I actually am an advocate, a supporter of Zionism. But here we would have to distinguish, okay? Because this is at odds with the dominant understanding in a way, if I put it this way, we would have to distinguish between spiritual and material Zionism, right? Not unlike the distinction made by Martin Buber between prophetic Judaism and Jewish nationalism. Zionism in its spiritual sense is a lofty aspiration. He states in October 1931 interview with the Jewish Chronicle, and he went on to elaborate, quote, by spiritual sense, I mean they should want to realize the Jerusalem that is within. That is within. By spiritual, I mean, I'm going to quote again, they should want to realize the Jerusalem that is within. 
Zionism, meaning reoccupation of Palestine, has no attraction for me. I can understand the longing of a Jew to return to Palestine, and if he can do so without the help of bayonets, whether his own or those, whether his own or those of Britain, then he says, I'm fine with it, right? But you see, it's again that argument which I had mentioned 10 minutes ago, which is important for him, the fact that he sees this form of Jewish aspiration, this kind of Zionism as backed up by British arms, you know, all right? Now, um, um, I have a lot more on that, but but in the interest of, of, of time, I'm going, to, I'm going to omit that. Their spiritual aspirations, Gandhi advises the Jews, need not be manifested in the shape of a nation state in Palestine, even if their desire to live for this fulfillment is understandable. Taken in summation, however, Gandhi appears to summon some further reasons for his inability to support the Jewish case. If Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and others were to, were to be left to resolve the difference amongst themselves, precisely the same position had to be advocated apropos Jews and Arabs in Palestine. Um, as a little footnote, uh, Hind Swaraj uh, is actually an extraordinary argument against the third party. You know, the British are the third party. They're the ones who come who come between the Hindus and the Muslims, right? Uh, the doctor is the third party. He comes between, between the patient and his own self. The lawyer is the third party because he comes between two parties, right? The whole book is an argument against the third party. That's one of many ways in which one can read it, right? So you see really shades of Hind Swaraj over here. Okay, Zionism as a material movement back to the hilt by the force of arms and sustained by an imperial power could only exist in an adversarial position vis-a-vis -vis the Arabs. And I quote here, this is from Nehru though, as the idea of Muslim nationalism was fabricated with British encouragement in India, so also the idea of Zionism was fabricated by British imperialism in Palestine. Now, I don't think Gandhi would ever put the matter so starkly, but nevertheless, he shared the view that Jewish claims would crumble without British support. Gandhi's long experience of British rule in South Africa and India had made him deeply suspicious of imperial powers, and he was convinced that Jewish aspirations for a homeland were morally untenable if they could not be sustained without the massive militarization of Palestine. Now I'll get to Martin Buber, so I'm moving towards the end. But before I do that, I want to return to something that had come up in his statement, which I said I would return to. We should deliberate on his understanding of social relations between religious communities in India and his invocation of the history of nonviolent resistance in South Africa, right? Because in this statement, he, he will advert to this history in South Africa and what what they were doing there and why this can be an object lesson for Jews. In his attempt to explain the plight of Jews and the course of action open to them, he draws on two perhaps contentious parallels. First, when he commences with a brief account of his lifelong association with Jews, he adds this characterization of them. Excuse me. They have been the untouchables of history. I'm quoting him. The parallel between the treatment by Christians and the treatment of untouchables by Hindus is very close, end quote. Now, one might, of course, legitimately question Gandhi's understanding of how precisely religious sanctions were used to suppress untouchables in India and Jews under Christian rule, rulers. One might also point to the fact that unlike the Jews, the untouchables were not in search of a homeland. Although I'm reminded here of the famous remark made by Ambedkar um, to Gandhi when he said, Mahatmaji, you know, they were having a conversation and then he says, Mahatmaji, I do not have a homeland, right? So I would also ask you to keep that in mind because that will kind of reverberate now for the next 10, 15 minutes, you know, right? Um, or so, yeah. The Jews, indeed, the Jews were an eminently diasporic people, but Gandhi would not have been unsettled 
by the many differences that underlie the histories of the Dalits and the Jews. Some would say to take one further illustration that the untouchables as they were then called were assimilated into the fold of Hinduism to a much greater degree than were Jews in Christian society. There is obviously the question of scale. The Ati Shudras and Shudras if one were working within an enumerated word may well have been the majority or maybe the majority in India. In 1932, Gandhi had resisted with a fast unto death, an attempt as he saw it to provide Dalits with a corporate political identity that placed them outside the fold of Hinduism. And as he had drawn a parallel between Dalits and Jews, one might understand why he would have been similarly resistant to attempts to cast Jews as possessed of a distinct political identity that could only find its expression in a national homeland of, in Palestine. The far more interesting question to ask, one can, I cannot really enter into here because it's a very long and complicated set of questions that would arise from it, is to ask whether Gandhi read Judaism through the experience of Christianity and whether he may not have tacitly accepted some of the assumptions that historically shaped Christian interpretations of Judaism. Whatever the merits or otherwise of the parallel that Gandhi was to draw between Jews and Dalits, I cannot but believe that he would also have had in mind the larger history of social relations between religious communities in India and in particular the unusual history of Jews in India. The Palestine of the biblical conception is not a geographical tract, he says in his statement of 1938. It is in their hearts. Some Jews, he stresses, claim to be the chosen race and they are proved and they are to prove it so by choosing. It's a different twist altogether on being the chosen race. They are to prove it by choosing the way of nonviolence for vindicating their position on earth. Yet perhaps they were also the chosen race because it was their singular experience and only theirs to claim the entire world as their own. Quote, every country is their home including Palestine, not by aggression, but by loving service. All right. And here I have a little portion, which I've already sort of mentioned where I talk about the history of Jews um, um, in India. All right. Um, and then there's a question of history of uh, the, uh, the, treat, uh, the, the, the parallel that he draws with the travails of Indians, the parallel between the, the sufferings of the Jews and the travails or sufferings of Indians in South Africa. Let me thus turn to that other parallel which surfaces in his pronouncements on Jewish aspirations, most particularly in his statement of 1938, when he can counsels the Jews to engage in mass nonviolent resistance, arguing that Jews have in the Indian Satyagraha campaign in South Africa an exact parallel. There the Indians occupied precisely the same place that the Jews occupy in Germany. The persecutors had also a religious tinge. President Kruger used to say that the white Christians were the chosen of God and Indians were inferior beings created to serve the whites. Now, no one was really persuaded by this comparison that Gandhi made and certainly not Martin Buber, right? And this brings me to one of the last things before I move to sort of the more speculative philosophical speculations with which I will end, which is the so-called Gandhi-Buber exchange. I say so-called because there's no exchange. Gandhi writes this piece published on 26 November 1938. It comes to the attention of Buber and Buber writes a letter which we have no record that Gandhi actually ever received. Okay, I mean there are people who have said that well Gandhi was so shattered by the response that he couldn't there is no record of Gandhi having ever received this letter and Gandhi was certainly not one to back down from something of this kind. Uh, 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 and we, we, you know, if, if you don't know this, but as far as I'm aware, there isn't a single letter that Gandhi ever received, no matter how trivial, which went unanswered. So uh, some certainly a very lofty uh, statement of the kind that Buber issues is something that Gandhi would have replied to at that point had it come to his particular um, attention. Uh, and this letter has been talked about quite a bit because one of Buber's biographer points out that uh, 
Huber admired Gandhi, quote, more than any living person in public life. So it was obviously something that Buber wrote with great pain, which he actually points out explicitly that, you know, this is really painful for me to write a letter of this kind to you because I hold you in great reverence and all of that, right? So this is a letter written from Jerusalem on 24th February, um, 1939. And Buber says that he's been agonizing over it for a very long period of time. And then he, and then he quotes, uh, 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 Gandhi uh, uh, sometimes uh, writing in equal parts on astonishment and admonishment. Jews are being persecuted, robbed, maltreated, tortured, murdered. And you, Mahatma Gandhi, say that their position in the country where they suffer, all this is an exact parallel to the position of Indians in South Africa at the time you inaugurated your famous force of truth or strength of the soul, Satyagraha campaign. Right, and Buber then says, and he quotes him at further length. And Buber says that you know, um, none of what none of what you have written has any bearing on the position of Jews in Germany. Are you not aware of the burning of synagogues? Do you know what a concentration camp is like and what goes on there? Its methods of slow and quick slaughter, right? So forth and so on. Right? And he says that only ignorance can explain this tragicomic utterance that has emanated from your mouth when you dared to compare the two situations. Surely Gandhi knew that the 150,000 Indians in South Africa were nourished on the hope that there were 200 million of them in India. All right. Okay. And it's a little bit like saying that the 40 million black people in America, right, who are being killed, murdered, incarcerated, all of that, that they can look to the 700 million Africans, black people in Africa, they can look to them for succor, for support, that they know that that's their homeland. Of course not. Right? I mean, in a sense, if Buber is going to analogize the situation, then it seems to me that perhaps this might be one instance one could pick and say, well, does Buber argument make much sense? Right? What might be some of the difficulties there? How did Gandhi overlook the fact, Buber says, the fact that the Jews had nothing like a mother India to which they could look for spiritual repose, material assistance, and so on. Last but not least was Gandhi unable to comprehend that nothing in the experience of humankind could have prepared one for a regime of the type encountered in totalitarian Germany, right? And then, of course, he says something that everyone has always mentioned in this context. And do you think perhaps that a Jew in Germany could pronounce in public one single sentence of a speech such as yours without being knocked down, right? The, the argument, in, in other words, being that Satyagraha worked in India because the British were at the end of the day, a civil lot, you know. Um, yeah, they were fundamentally decent people and all of that. And, and so therefore one has to be able to de distinguish these positions, you know, all right. Now I have already indicated um, that, I mean, one thing that is central to Buber's argument is a majority minority I've argument I've already indicated that that Gandhi was singularly unimpressed throughout his life with arguments that hovered around ideas of majority and minority and I think he would have found it impossible to agree with the suggestion that mother India was a guarantee which is what we were saying of some kind of guarantee to Indians in South Africa of their political and social entitlements. There isn't a shred of evidence really for that in a way. But I think that the, actually the evidence to the contrary is, is that even remember in the late 1960s and early 1970s when India is now an established nation state that Indians were just being thrown out of Kenya and Uganda, particularly Uganda, completely expelled and India could do nothing. It was completely impotent, frankly, in the face of what happened in the 1960s and early 1970s, all right? So this idea that somehow there is, you know, there, these diasporic Indians can get this material support and all of that from India sitting, you know, from 500 million people or whatever number there is, uh, 
uh, is an argument that I think, frankly, is quite far-fetched in various ways, right? The other interesting part of the argument, which is a fundamental problem, is that Buber fails to recognize that the Jews, Gandhi recognizes it in Germany, are actually well organized, extremely educated, and that they have the force of world opinion. Now, why that world opinion didn't work in their favor is a different question, right? But but they had the they had, as Jews have today, the force of world opinion behind them. You know, I mean, you have a single incidence of anti-Semitism, the Anti-Defamation League in the US will immediately record it and it will be publicized widely. You know, that's whereas the Indians in South Africa were indentured laborers largely. There was, of course, a second class of Indians, the so-called passenger Indians, Gandhi being one among them who were, you know, relatively more educated sometimes as in the case of Gandhi, quite well educated. You know, but point is that there was a class of Indians who weren't indentured laborers, but the bulk of Indians in South Africa actually belonged to the indentured community, where levels of literacy were extremely low, they were very poor, right? The, this was not the position of Jews in Germany at all. In fact, Gandhi says that this is a very gifted community, right? And they have organized world opinion behind them. And thirdly, I mean, again, in, in the interest of expediting things, I'm condensing it because there would be, Buber's response would also take a very long period of time. But what is interesting is that Buber falls into the same arguments that colonial states have fallen into. And one of the things he says is, and here I quote, right? This is to justify the Jewish migration into Palestine. Quote, ask the soil what the Arabs have done for her in 1300 years and what we the Jews have done for her in 50. Okay. The argument here is, it's a very common argument that when you get to Oriental people and that's the Arabs, Indians, all of the others, they don't know what to do with the land. They're lazy. The land is unproductive. It goes waste. You give it to Protestants or you give it to Jews and they will multiply, they would make it come alive, you know, right? I mean, he, this argument runs throughout his response to Gandhi. It's really quite remarkable that he can fall into this kind of argument, you know, all right? Okay, so in conclusion, how else can we think of it? What are the larger kinds of country considerations that we might want to now think about? Besides Buber, other Jewish commentators, all admirers of Gandhi, but troubled if not tormented by what they took to be his inexplicable injustice to the Jewish people would step into the debate. These rich exchanges, I would suggest, do not call for a vindication of one position or another. They can be read more productively, perhaps, as contributions to an ethical, ethically informed, eloquent, and philosophically subtle disquisition on the multiple meanings of home and disposition. We often make a home and dispossess others by our act. The home that we long for, when realized, suddenly loses all its attractions. Our home might come to burden or haunt us creating other forms of dispossession. Our actual homes may well be elsewhere than the home in which we live. We may be at home in not being home at all. And the home that we call home may have no relation to the home that is in the heart. The home that we turn over to our guests at long last begins to look and feel like a home. The home that is not ours takes shape as a home in the mind of the honored guest. That home with which we draw a boundary to keep out others becomes more than a marker of territory, helping shape conceptions of the outside and the inside, the other and the self, the alien and the familiar. That home which keeps out others is evidently a home to some and not a home to others. 
we may, like the reluctant exile, gain a political home and lose our cultural home. We may have several homes and yet feel dispossessed, or we may have no home at all and feel that the world is all ours. The only home truth is that the politics of home and dispossession is not to be unraveled by which by the uh, by unraveled by the homilies with which nationalisms are created, nurtured, and explained and exploited. Now recall that quotation from Ambedkar, right? Where Ambedkar says to Gandhi, 1931, Mahatmaji, you know, I have no homeland. You know, they're they're having this whole discussion. And finally, this is the note on which Ambedkar concludes it. I want to suggest to you that Gandhi was also someone who eventually saw himself as having no home. One of the many ways in which his life might be interpreted is to view him as a man who in the last analysis felt himself at sea in the world. In this respect, though he was not in his quest for a homeland, he most likely saw himself as akin to the Jews. His life offers fleeting impressions of someone who, even as his feet was, were firmly planted on the ground, was curiously unmoored, right? So he, he, you know that he moves from one ashram to another. He doesn't actually share a family home, right? Begin with that, because it was always an extended family type, right? That was overwhelmingly from his days in South Africa on to India when he comes to Ahmedabad and before, of course, he establishes the ashram, the most famous ashram at Sabarmati. There's another ashram at Kochrab, which he abandons. And then, of course, he moves to Sevagram. And then, you know, then last year he's moving from place to place, right? Okay. So he's, and, and he's sharing his life, not just with Kasturba and their sons, their four sons, and their adopted daughter, but with dozens and hundreds of inmates in communes and ashrams, okay? Because if the idea of a home also implies a private sphere, Gandhi displayed complete indifference to the idea of privacy. In fact, he saw it as a species of secrecy and, and deception. Uh, you know, he spends a lot of time in cities, but the city is alien to him. It's not surprising that the city took his life eventually, right? Well, by that, I mean, of course, he was shot, as you know, in, in Delhi, all right? Um, so it, at that level, we can make the argument that I'm really making here. But at another arg level, we have to think about the fact that Gandhi even though he's at the forefront of the freedom struggle, is, has no attachment really to the idea of the nation state. I cannot think of another quote nationalist who was less wedded to the idea of the nation state than was Gandhi. You know? And it's not surprising in that sense that, that August 15th, 1947, he was to be found nowhere in Delhi. He was in Calcutta. Um, uh, at that time. There are reasons for that and that partly has to do. I mean, most people will simply explain it by what was happening, you know, the violence and he wanted to put it down and all of that. But but of course, one has to read it in, in, in many other registers, including this whole idea of what it means to be sort of, um, you know, uh, without uh, a, a homeland. Um, and and some of you here might be thinking, well, you know, uh, how, how does one really think about all of this in relation to to obviously what's happening um, at the moment. And I will simply say one thing over there, which is that I think that, um, I mean, my own view is, is in support of the position that was advocated by Edward Said uh, for the first time uh, in, in explicitly in an article in the New York Times uh, magazine, I think in 1999, where he argued explicitly for uh, a, a binational, uh, binational state. Um, and, um, I think it is very important if we're going to think through this, um, it is very important that we should re retain in our mind the thought of the two catastrophes which are really linked. Okay. And that by that, I mean, of course, the Holocaust, which I think we should actually just typify through that paradigmatic word, 
Auschwitz, much like the Holocaust itself became in a way, and problematically, the paradigmatic instance of what one might describe as you know, mass suffering um, uh, in our times. But the two catastrophes that we have to retain together, because that's the only way to really think through this, which is exactly, I think, what Gandhi's article is really doing, the statement of 26 November 1938. These two catastrophes, these two catastrophes are Auschwitz and, and the dispersal and dispossession of the Palestinians. Okay, so these two infernos, I think, have to be really, are really captured. I think they are almost incipient in a way in what Gandhi was really trying to say. Are there also very other interesting things that emerge from this if one had to carry the discussion much further? Because, I mean, one of the, uh, uh, you know, I started with Hannah Arendt, but you have to remember that when Hannah Arendt was writing, let us not forget that the problem of refugees was a problem when she's talking about at that point, okay? And this is, and she's really talking about the 20s, 30s and 40s. The problem at that point of refugees is a European problem. It's a European problem. This was a problem that League of Nations was trying to address. In the post-World War II, the refugee problem becomes our problem, the rest of the world, the global south, the third world. It becomes their problem, you know, all right? And of course, this is probably, if we are reading this metaphorically, the whole thing as an argument also about dispossession and all of that, then that is probably, it seems to me the fundamental issue of the times as well. The refugee, you know, the, 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 the materiality being obviously millions of refugees, six, seven million Syrians alone, you know, not to mention refugees elsewhere, okay, right, okay. Uh, but also this, that when we think about refugees, we also, modern day refugees, particularly post-World War II, we see how all the registers shifted from the League of Nations is thinking about, about refugees as a European problem, which it was in the aftermath of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, the collapse of the, uh, the, the Central European you know, uh, uh, state formation over there. Okay, the Bolshevik revolution, the nationality question as Lenin addresses it, all of that. And then post-World War II, it really becomes a problem of the third world, so to speak, the global south, right? So those would be some of the other things that we may have to think through, which come out of it. But, but I think I would want to simply end by, as I've said already, by suggesting that it is imperative that we retain the thought of both of these catastrophes together. The problem is we only, depending on our political disposition and our nation state identification, our nationality, our religion, we only want to hold on to the idea of one of the catastrophes, not both of them. And it is not incidental that these two catastrophes should be so intimately linked with each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lal. Uh, you have opened a lot of categories and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, comments and questions. Let me quickly go to the chat box and uh, uh, see what do we have over there from the side of the participants. Uh, so we have three questions and I'm going to take them uh, one by one uh, in order of uh, them being posted. The first question, uh, Professor, is um, in 1949, Nehru uh, met Albert Einstein and they exchanged letters after that. Einstein lobbied for recognition of Israel. However, Nehru politely declined. Yeah. Was Nehru influ influenced by Gandhi's view? Uh, that's the first question. Do you want to take it one by one or uh, shall we look at all three questions and then uh, you would like to... Let me, let me take the second one as well, at least, because I have yes. put this one down. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so the second one then uh, is, uh, dear Professor Lal, based on your arguments, uh, is it fair to say that Gandhi's position to Jewish homeland in Palestine was greatly influenced by uh, means adopted, for example, arms and British colonialism? Would he have been more favorable to their claims or ends if they had adopted nonviolent means? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, and uh, the third one is also related to this uh, uh, in, in some, some sure. way. So I'm sure. going to read that also. And then maybe we can uh, take next set of questions after you have responded sure. to them. Sure. Sure. Uh, so uh, this question is, since you mentioned about the sound uh, uh, media voice that Jews had, I wish to understand how consolidated the Jewish community in Germany was. Was yeah. there any intersectionality within the Jews uh, that rendered them uh, caught with internal problems while anti-Semitism was uh, widespread in Europe? Yeah, yeah. So beginning with the third question, which is a very good question. Yes, I mean, the question of whether one can speak of a singular Jewish community, uh, which is what the question is saying that, well, you know, should we think of it really as that? And, and the answer is that no, actually there were, there was a considerable uh, set of differences uh, among Jewish intellectuals. Uh, in in Germany, uh, uh, because uh, and you can you can imagine you can anticipate what the major fault line would have been. The major fault line was that there was already a considerable strand of what we might describe as a Jewish secular life in Germany. That many of the Jews there really thought of themselves as secular. All right. Um, uh, whether that secular means the same secular as it means elsewhere, for example, let's say for Edward Said, you know, his whole life being committed to a certain kind of secular cultural criticism, as it were, uh, is a different question in a way. But uh, the four times in Germany were very clear there. That is, there are some who identify them as secular, some who identify themselves as strongly German before they were anything else, actually. Okay, uh, and then there were some who who retained their Jewish practices um, and at the same time also identified with Germany, and that of course began to shift, uh, and it began to shift really not just with the passage of the first anti-Semitic laws in 1933, the Nuremberg Laws, but a, a little before that, you know. Uh, because uh, I think in a sense, some saw the writing on the wall, not very many, but some did. And then there are some, of course, who through various other practices, such as, for example, marriage with marriage with Christians, okay, uh, tried to stake a different position. All right. So that's, that's really the, the simplest answer uh, to that question. But the question, as I said, is important in that one cannot speak of really a singular Jewish community. On the other hand, I would still want to rather forcefully argue that there is a much stronger case to be made for anti-Semitism. That is that not a case for anti-Semitism. That is a case for anti-Semitism being much stronger uh, in, um, uh, in uh, other parts of uh, uh, Europe and in particularly in, in uh, France um, and England than was the case in Germany. I think that that's actually the most important thing when one is really looking at uh, the fate of the Jews um, uh, in, uh, uh, in Germany, all right? Now, uh, was, uh, so Nehru met 1949, yes, I know about the Nehru Einstein, and is it the case that uh, Nehru's views here regarding the recognition of Israel by India were influenced by Gandhi? Uh, well, uh, I, I think that this statement of 1938, which I in the beginning described as having a fugitive existence, but remember I mentioned that it has it had a fugitive existence in Western discussions. I think in India, that statement was actually quite well known. All right. And of course, I, I think that Gandhi um, was well aware, uh, Nehru, sorry, was well aware of uh, Gandhi's views on uh, the subject. Uh, I mean, I was looking, um, you know, some month, uh, some years ago, and I wrote a long, long piece which hasn't been published yet uh, on on the on the position of the Congress um, on such questions as the Holocaust. You know, why didn't why didn't we hear a lot more uh, in in India about the Holocaust? Uh, one answer to that, of course, is that one didn't hear much about the Holocaust even in the West until after it was over, until after it was over, okay? I mean, you know, you, you, you go through the newspapers in the 1940, uh, 40, 43, 44, 
uh, it, there's, there's not much discussion of it. It was basically the war. It wasn't really the fate of the Jews that was bothering most Americans. And, and some of you are well aware of the fact that there were Jews who were turned away you know, from the US as well, right? So the answer to that question now is a bit complicated in the sense that uh, Nehru is not someone uh, who simply will embrace views that Gandhi held necessarily. He's a, he's, he's a person who uh, was a person of independent thinking in many respects, you know. Um, and I think we would have to take a larger geopolitical view, okay? A larger geopolitical view of why it is that Nehru was really against what we might describe as real recognition. You know that there was recognition in 1950, but, but diplomatic relations were not actually started until several decades later. You know, and that geopolitical view has to do with a great many things, far more than, for example, things like India's dependency on oil uh, and all of that. I mean, it has to do with the history of decolonization at that time where India situated itself. It has to do with the fact that right from the outset of the creation of Israel, it became very clear that the position of the British had now been replaced by the Americans and arms would be critical to maintaining Israel. Okay, that Israel was really being maintained with the backup of American military might, just as it had been British military might before. And I think that that's one reason, one principal reason why Nehru was frankly reluctant to take a side that was explicitly pro and pro, you know, uh, uh, supporting uh, Israel, all right? So, which leads me to the, the second question, because the question there was, would Gandhi have been more receptive to the Jewish claim if the Jews had practiced nonviolence? I think the answer is yes, it would have been. He, he would have been, right? Um, uh, but the, then, the, then we would have to ask what the implication of that might be. Does that undermine some of the other philosophical claims in a sense? Uh, does, it, does it undermine his uh, uh, distinction between spiritual and material Zionism? Uh, does it undermine his claim that Jerusalem is not really a, a place on the map? It's something in your heart. No, I don't think so. Because we have to remember that Ahimsa is not just the means now. You see, then we would have to see what the place of Ahimsa is in his worldview, in his epistemological framing. That if Ahimsa is so critical and it has a fundamental relationship to Satya, then this is not simply a matter of saying, ah, well, now they've adopted nonviolence. This is just a technicality. No, because it means in some sense, it's, it's a shift in the register of worldviews, you see? And so the short answer to that question is emphatically, yes, in my view, that he would have been unquestionably in favor uh, of Jewish claims if the Jewish case had rested on nonviolence, which it certainly did not at that time. You know, I, I think I've addressed all three questions. Yeah, we, uh, there's one more question which has accidentally uh, been sent in privately to me. Uh, shall I read that to you, sir? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Considering how the state of Israel has uh, evolved in the last seven decades, and also its origin in the backdrop of British colonialism, mm. if one has to speculate, would mm. Gandhi consider the present Israeli state as, a, as a being colonial? Oh, I think the answer is yes. No question you would consider this uh, uh, colonial. I mean, the treatment, uh, you know, in view of everything that's happened, uh, I mean, the, the position of... Uh, uh, the uh, the Arabs, the Palestinian population, uh, you know, in the occupied territories, and particularly uh, the the kinds of xenophobic nationalism which have now become common in so many parts of the world. They, they have it, all of this has been a matter of great solace and encouragement to the Israelis. I mean, as far as they can tell, their model is now being used in many parts of the world. You know, right? I mean, that's effectively that's certainly one way to look at it. 
uh, and and I think that there's no question that Gandhi would have seen um, this as uh, colonial occupation. Now, it is necessary to add this though. Very necessary, because I think this is where Gandhi's view is going to differ. And what's necessary to add is that he invariably takes the view. This, you can see this in Hind Swaraj. What does he say in Hind Swaraj? And what is the view that he invariably takes? He takes invariably the view that a people who are colonized are always complicit in their colonization in various ways. Right? What does he say in Hind Swaraj? We want, you know, the tiger's strength and all of that. Right? But we don't want to look like the tiger. I mean, paraphrasing. Right? We don't want its stripes. Right? We, we want, you, you know, that we were seduced by the glitter of the West. That's one reason we were colonized, right? We were seduced by the glitter of the West, that we had a hand to play in our own colonization. Now, and, and this is where he becomes sometimes not just difficult, but sometimes becomes difficult for people to accept. I'll give you, a, I'll give you one illustration, okay? Uh, almost never talked about by anyone in the literature. I myself have written uh, recently about uh, the Turkish, as you know, the Turkish reluctance, reluctance is putting it mildly, they're adamant about not uh, admitting to the genocide committed against the Armenians, you know, right? Okay, now Gandhi actually does talk about the Armenians. Volume 22, I think it is, uh, of the collected works, there's a, there's a, this is when he's talking about the Khilafat move and he says something there which will seem grossly unacceptable, okay, to almost everybody. Because he, he says that, you know, he received a letter from someone and that letter uh, talked about the noble Armenians and how they were being persecuted and all of that and that they're a great and glorious place. And Gandhi says, this is all rubbish, okay? I mean, he effectively says that this person is completely ignorant. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He says, look, I'm not going to defend Turkish atrocities. There's no question that tur Turkish atrocities have taken place. But he says the Armenians and the Greeks have done much worse before okay they've done much worse now whether that's the case or not we would have to look at the history of what the armenians were doing but what he also says very clearly is that you cannot expect to get uh, you cannot expect to get to hear anything good about the turks from the western press particularly at this point in time after the dismemberment of the ottoman empire you know right so he's, he's very astute. Uh, he knows what's happening in the world. And I'm not saying that he is therefore defending the atrocities. He's very clear against the Armenians. He's very clear. He says the Turks have done, you know, damage. They've, they've killed people, all of that. But, but he's not simply going to become sentimental and say, well, therefore all good resides with the Armenians. No. And this is therefore what I'm suggesting here is that yes, the colonization uh, uh, by Israel is a fact that Gandhi would accept, but I think he would also ask for introspection in the Arab world. Just look at how the Palestinians are treated elsewhere in the Arab world. I think that itself will give you a very good answer of how Gandhi would have looked at some of these questions. And I think this is one reason he's, it's very hard for him to find, particularly today, any supporters because he's just absolutely candid about what he thinks are the issues that we have to address. Are there any other questions? Hello? Oh, I have, I did not unmute myself. I'm so sorry. Oh. So we have two more questions. One is related to what you were saying just now, but I'm going to go in the order of how they have been asked. Uh, considering how the state of Israel has evolved in the last seven decades, sorry. Uh, what would, uh, what, one, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what would be a Gandhian view on the BDS movement is uh, one question. Yeah. And uh, the 
uh, and I would consider the next one as the last question. Uh, the last question is Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Arabs are uh, complicit in Israeli occupation of their land, which is actually settler colonialism. Please yes. elaborate. So it's related to what you were just explaining uh, yes. right now. Yeah. So just yeah. these two. And yeah. I think uh, we can stop here taking questions. If, yeah. If, okay. yeah. yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So the Gandhian view on BDS. Um, okay. So the boycott, divestment and all of that. Right. Sanctions. Um, well, so, I mean, we are all aware of the fact that Gandhi used um, uh, the strategy of boycott. Um, uh, th th this didn't begin with Gandhi, of course. I'm sure all of you who are uh, students of Indian history know that uh, it was used during the Swadeshi movement um, in, in um, uh, the uh, you know in the early years uh, of the last century, uh, on which uh, many have written, including Shumit Sarkar, who wrote an exhaustive study of this. Um, and and so boycotts and and of course the word boycott actually goes back to Ireland. Uh, uh, the Parnell Commission has, has a whole discussion on the origins of boycott, um, which was again in the context of colonialism, you know, English colonialism in Ireland, which is where the origins of the strategy of boycott, named after a person called boycott, began. Um, and, and so Gandhi certainly deployed that. So in principle, he would have used it. But here, here this is where the difficulties come in again. You know, the difficulty, is, number one, is that, you see, I think that for nearly everyone today, all of these are what we might call techniques. These, this is part of the arsenal of how you resist the oppressor. You know, you, you use boycotts, you use divestment strategy, you impose sanctions. Um, and, and I think we need to have some serious reservations about how some of these are used. Who is imposing sanctions? Uh, for example, if I just said to you hypothetically, that the United States should be under sanctions from the rest of the world for atrocities it has committed, okay, over the course of the last 200 years and which it continues to commit, uh, including against its own people. Well, who's going, to, who's going to support sanctions against the U.S.? No one, partly because you can't do it. It's, it's not possible, given the geopolitical situation that we really have today, all right? Uh, given the inequities and in power and the power structure that we have, it's simply not possible, right? Um, now, uh, Gandhi, I think, would therefore have been extremely ambivalent about the BDS movement, partly also because he would likely have seen, I'm, I mean, I would have to really look at it very closely and look at all some aspects of it, but he would have seen part of it as a strategy of coercion um, and I know that this will sound like an idealist reading of, of Ahimsa, but Gandhi was always insistent in holding to the view that coercion cannot be a part of Ahimsa at all. And of course, the critic would argue even a well-intentioned sympathetic to crit, uh, 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 a critic who's sympathetic to Gandhi might well argue that, well, it's impossible to not um, exercise coercion in the exercise of Ahimsa. Didn't Gandhi himself exercise coercion? Uh, and uh, then one would have to really parse each situation and see what Gandhi really wrote. Um, okay. Um, uh, so, so the short if, if answer is, is that I don't think that there is uh, an unequivocal way of saying that Gandhi would have supported BDS. Uh, the other important thing, uh, and, and I wasn't really specifically here, uh, if, for example, we're going to have a movement where we say that, uh, because, you know, part of BDS, for those of us in the academic world, it also implies that academics should not go uh, to Israel, because in going to Israel, they are, Patho Chatterjee wrote a very a piece about five years ago that circulated very widely, uh, where he describes about why, why he's never going to travel to Israel. Well, why does he travel to and live in the U.S.? Because the, U, the, the Israel is backed up by the U.S. Let's not forget that. I mean, if, if the Nuremberg idea is going to hold up, the Nuremberg idea is that you go back to the chain with which it begins. Okay, where does it begin? Where is Israel without, particularly in the last six decades, I think that now it's becoming quasi-autonomous in some of its positions in a way, but where is Israel without the backing of the U.S.? 
So, and this is apart from all other considerations such as, well, how does one express solidarity with certain kinds of um, intellectuals and activists, you know, in the West now? Um, and some people have argued that, well, actually this movement is to be supported because the call for it really comes from Palestinian activists, writers, intellectuals themselves. But I don't think that that is entirely the case. It, it is a case that it comes from many of them, but I think that I think that one would really have to look at, in many ways, its U.S. origins and the influence exercised by academics in the U.S. for BDS. You know, all right. So that would be, I think, my um, position on that. And then the question, the second question, I think I kind of addressed. You know, which is the question has to do with our uh, our Palestinian um, are the Arabs themselves complicit? Well, in, in the broader way, yes. I mean, but I think that one shouldn't use that to, to, to uh, mitigate or to underestimate their suffering, the way in which their hands are tied uh, as well, right? Okay. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the phrase settler colonialism was used. And of course, Israel is, is uh, uh, increasingly being drawn into that settler colonial studies model, which is, you know, in the last 10, 15 years really become quite big. I have quite a few reservations about uh, some of that settler colonialism model, but but this is not the time and the place to go into to all of that, because that will take up quite a lot of time, you know. Yeah. Oh, we have uh, one last question in chat box, but only if you have time and you permit me to uh, read yeah, that for you. Yeah, so I'll take, let's, let's make that the last question, because I'm also getting a little exhausted now. So, yeah, but I'll take so, one question. Yeah, this is the abs absolute uh, last one because it's already there in the chat, chat box and thank you for agreeing to take that. Uh, uh, this is by a colleague from uh, Turkey. Uh, how do you see the changing view of uh, India's right on the Jewish problem? In initial years, the right wing appeared uh, in favor of Hitler and later on became pro-Jewish suddenly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, there are obviously, uh, there are obviously strong statements in support of uh, uh, what the Nazis were doing in the writings uh, of the Hindutva ideologues. That's, uh, that's known to everyone who reads widely uh, or even has picked up some newspaper accounts of that. Uh, what is said by, you know, Golwalkar, for example, uh, in a number of works, including a bunch of bunch of thoughts, uh, we are our nationhood book, you know. So that is true. That there is an expression of that. Um, the question here is that uh, how does one view that in relationship to uh, the pro-Israel sentiments uh, that have been voiced uh, by um, the uh, the BJP, um, you know, and uh, its supporters. Uh, and my submission to you is there is absolutely no contradiction in that whatsoever. None whatsoever. There's no difficulty. I don't have any problem with uh, understanding how that's possible because I want to be very clear that, yes, I think that actually there are people in the party uh, who adhere exactly to the views that were adhered to by uh, Goldwalker, Hedgeber, and that whole lot. Okay, uh, which has been argued, as I said, by a number of people. They hold to those views. They are also able to embrace a very strong pro-Israel position because what they do is they create a bifurcation. That bifurcation is you take your ideology, ideology from these people in the 30s, the Hindutva ideologues. They see Israel as a model of a no-nonsense nation state, okay? This is a state that knows how to handle dissent. That's why they love Israel, just like the Indian diaspora in the US absolutely loves Israel, no question about it. They are very enthusiastic supporters. They look at what Israel is doing, how it handles security questions, a national security state model, how it thinks about terrorism, I mean, we all know that the links now between India and Israel go far beyond just 
you know, overt statements of foreign policy appreciation and all of that. I mean, Israeli generals spend a lot of time in India. You know, they, 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 it's their second after the retirement, come to India, get a good lucrative contract. All of that, all of that is being done. We also know that, you know, there are, that links have in many other ways grown because it's very common uh, for young Israelis after they have finished their military service, both men and women, to come to India. They spend a year in India, they chill out. I mean, there are, I have been to restaurants where the menu is only in Hebrew. You can't even get the menu in English or Hindi, okay? In North India, I'm talking about you, right? I mean, there are all kinds of links of this kind that have been established. Of course, arms dealings have shot up through the roof between the two countries. None of that contradicts the view that they have, okay, the BJP, which is a view that they really embraced, as I said, you know, back in the 19. 30s, of course, the BJP didn't exist, and but you mean the Hindutva ideologues, you know, who have been important in shaping the worldview, right? There is no contradiction there. That's really the way to think through this, I would say.